Facebook Live and get that recording started. So hang tight, everybody. All right, good morning. Oh, hang on. There we go. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Lee Arnold, and welcome to He's the Solution Ministries. Glad to have you all here with us this morning. If you would, please open up your Bibles to the book of Daniel. Uh, and we are going to be getting a new study this morning uh, in the book of Daniel. So uh, take your Bible, crack it down the center, and then hang a right, and you will come to Daniel, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, if you find yourself in Nahum or Joel uh, or Zechariah, you have gone too far. So Daniel chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, let's read the text together, and then we'll come back and um, talk about what's going on here. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoam, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Asaphanes, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hanai, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel received, resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, verse 12, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their clothes and food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. And to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the year of King Cyrus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you for the book of Daniel. Lord, I thank you for 
this study. I thank you for what you are going to teach us through it. Lord, what you will reveal to us through it. Lord, I pray that uh, this morning you would just help us to be attentive and to be excited and enthusiastic about what your word will have for us today, Lord. So I ask that you would just take away all the distractions, Lord, that you would uh, help us to be focused, help us to be here in this moment. And Lord, help us to be anxiously and enthusiastically waiting on your word, whatever it is you would have to tell us this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help me to get out of the way so that we can hear directly from you. So Lord, open up our hearts, soften our hearts, take away the distractions of thought, and Lord, help us to just be here in this moment with you. We ask you this now, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. This book is an inspirational example to us and has tremendous lessons for us about how we are to walk in the world in which we live. It is perhaps the most prophetic book in the entire Bible. For the book of Daniel is the key that unlocks the book of Revelation. The book of Daniel confounds the critics, but it comforts the Christian because it confirms our faith. In his own day, Daniel was a legend. His contemporary Ezekiel puts him in the same category as Job and Noah. In fact, he's one of only a couple of Old Testament characters of whom no sin is mentioned. Now, this doesn't mean he didn't sin, but it does mean his life was not given to sin. Now, I've titled this message, If You Want to See God Laugh, Make Plans. Because here we're going to be introduced to Daniel and his three friends, who I'm sure had plans. And they were going in one direction, and as a result of this war, find themselves going in a completely different direction. And as we were going through our, our time of prayer this morning, I was just re reminded, as, as some of you were praying, that even in the midst of this whole COVID thing, I think we can all agree that it has derailed many of our plans. Uh, things that we were planning on doing three months ago, plan we were doing, plans we had three months from now. Many of those plans have now been altered as a result of COVID. And we can look at it from two perspectives. We can look at it and say, oh man, that's terrible. I wanted to do this. I was planning on going there. I had this in my calendar. We were going to go see these folks. And plans have changed. Plans have changed significantly. So as we study Daniel, I want you to look at how he approached adversity, how he approached change, how he approached captivity. Because I don't know about you, but I can tell you, for me, this whole stay in place, stay in home order has felt like captivity. It has felt like we have been trapped and, and we've not been able to leave. And as as American citizens, we do not like being told what to do. And I can't say it's just Americans that don't like being told what to do. We have Norman Debbie from Canada here. Uh, and, and I think it's just human nature. We don't like being told what to do. But here Daniel finds himself in this situation that he has no control over, would not have prescribed this for himself, and yet here he is. Now, Daniel's life is going to be characterized by three main points, and I want you guys to write these down. Point number one is that Daniel, Daniel's life has purpose. He was a man who purposed in his heart that he would walk with God. So purpose, or have we purposed in our hearts that we are going to walk with God? No matter what's going on, we're walking with God. Secondly, Daniel was a man of prayer. Are we praying? Now, my prayer time typically consists of my drive to the office every morning. Now, here again, this is, could be a plan that has changed because many don't have the opportunity to drive to an office. Now, some choose not to have one and they work from their home and that's cool. Uh, others are not allowed to go to their office because of stay in place, stay home. So we don't get to go to our office. I spoke with a gentleman uh, in Southern California last week who his office is still working from home. 
Now, we know that some states have lifted the bans on stay in place, stay home. Uh, many, many offices have now gone back to work, but there are still millions and millions of people either out of work, displaced by uh, uh, deferments, displaced by uh, layoffs, and others have been downsized so they're working less hours. I mean, it's pretty, well, let me say it this way. If I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and know where my future lies, I would be scared. COVID would scare me. But because of my hope in the Lord, COVID is just, you know, it's, it's just another thing that the Lord is using to get our attention. And he is going to use it to prove and to show that he is on the throne. He's in control. None of this surprises him. And thirdly, Daniel was a man of prophecy. He was interested in prophecy, and he was used as a vehicle for prophecy. Now, that's an interesting statement. He was interested in prophecy. Now, we have to be very careful here, because there are many who are interested in prophecy. But we need to qualify, what does it mean to be a prophet? A prophet is one who the Lord speaks to and through to reveal future occurrences, future happenings. Now, there are some alternative religions that are out there who claim to be following a prophet. But the criteria of a prophet is that their prophecies come true. Now, in the Bible, the Holy Bible, every prophet we read about from Daniel to Ezekiel to Isaiah, their prophecies have all come true. In fact, we will learn from the book of Daniel that there's only one prophecy in the book of Daniel that has not yet come true. So if you find yourself in a, a religion or a system that does not claim Christ or is where Jesus is just one of a handful of prophets, you must understand the criteria. To be a prophet means that your prophecies must come true. And every other prophet of every other religion other than Jesus Christ and Christianity, their prophets have erred. Their prophets have said things that have not come true. And that should be a big red flag. So for those of you that perhaps read a different Bible or one that's been translated differently, or you follow a different system, let this be a wake up call to check the prophet that you're following because it's a very good chance you're following the wrong prophet. For decades, the prophets had warned the rulers of Judah that their idolatry, immorality, and injustice toward the poor and needy would lead to the nation's ruin. And the prophets saw the day coming when God would bring the Babylonian army to destroy Jerusalem and the temple and take the people captive to Babylon. A century before the fall of Jerusalem, the prophet Isaiah had proclaimed this message in Isaiah 13, 21, and 39. And Micah, in, in his, contem his contemporary, shared the burden, Micah 4, chapter 4, verse 10. The prophet Habakkuk couldn't understand how Jehovah could use the godless Babylonians to chasten his own people. We see that in Habakkuk chapter 1. And Jeremiah lived to see his prophecies come true in Jeremiah chapter 20, 25, and 27. God would rather have his people living in shameful captivity in a pagan land than living like pagans in the holy land and disgracing his name. I believe that America is coming under a very similar judgment. And I believe that a lot of our world nations are coming under a very similar judgment. Now again, how could God want his people living in shameful captivity in a pagan land than living like pagans in the Holy Land and disgracing his name. So this captivity, this, this taking over by the Babylonian Empire, every prophet in the Bible was, was 
pointing to this. God had given to them divinely that these things would occur. Now, why were these things occurring? Why did God need his people in captivity? Because in freedom, they were not walking with the Lord. How many people have started going to a church or attending church online as a result of COVID who did not attend church previously? How many people have stayed home from church because they wanted to watch sports, <laughs> which aren't even on anymore? We have to look at what's going on globally with COVID and, and understand this is God's divine plan. And through it, I hope that he's getting everybody's attention. I can assure you he's gotten mine because all of the things that we thought were important, like working tirelessly or, or going to the office or doing this or doing that or our kids going to school or watching sporting events or attending or participating in sporting events, all of this is gone. Now, will it all come back? Well, I know that we are all hopeful that it would come back and we were all excited as we went from phase one to phase two to phase three and places were opening up again and we were allowed to go back to restaurants again and we were really excited. Okay, we're, we're on the other side now, COVID, let's go back to normal. And as we started going back to normal, the cases have started to rise again. Now, uh, Dana's prayer. You know, does COVID go away November 4th? Is this some political thing um, in another effort to eliminate the current administration? There's certainly those theories that exist out there, and I'm not here to say that they are right or wrong. What I can tell you is God is using COVID to get our attention. He's using COVID to get us to slow down and to think and to search out and to seek out a lot of people who would normally go to a church on Sunday have been in their homes for months. We are now seeing more deaths from suicide as a result of depression by being alone than we are seeing from COVID itself. For us as Christians, I, I think this is a tremendous opportunity now more than ever, for us to be bold for Christ and to say, hey, God's not surprised by COVID. And if we want to believe that COVID was created in a lab uh, by, by people in Wuhan, utilizing government money given to them by the Obama administration, and they concocted this COVID thing in a lab, you know, we can, we can go through all of these chains of conspiracy theories, but at the end of the day, we, we have to come to grips with the fact that this is God ordained because nothing happens that God did not ordain. So why is it happening? Because God needs to get our attention. America has been living in a sinful way for far too long. Just like Jerusalem was living in sin and God had to bring them under captivity, I believe that America has been living in sin and COVID is his way of bringing us into captivity because we are trapped to our homes. We are relegated to our homes. We, we are limited as to where we can go or how we can travel. Tell me that's not captive. So there's a lot of interesting parallels here between what's going on in Daniel's time and what's going on in our time. The third year of Jehoiakim would put us at 605 BC. So Josephus is a historian. Josephus would be considered the, the historian for the secular world. And a lot of the things that we understand in scripture have been validated through that writing. And so we know that in the third year of Jehoiakim, and this is chapter 1, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonian empire, the most powerful opponent, not only of that day, but probably of all time, seeking to consolidate his power in the Middle East, 
besieges Jerusalem. Now, when he would invade a country, defeat was certain. And after a victory, the Babylonians would take the most talented and useful people back to Babylon, and they would leave the poor behind to take whatever land they wanted and to live peacefully there. Now, this system fostered great loyalty from conquered lands and ensured a steady supply of wise and talented people for civil service. Now, I saw an article uh, just the other day talking about the decline of talent in America related to a number of things. The main thing that they want to point to is the uh, the policies as it relates to immigration into America. Now, for many, many years, America has been pro-immigration, pro-people coming into this country, uh, mainly for college. Uh, kids coming from all around the world to American colleges because it was believed that an education in America was more valuable than any other education you could get anywhere else. Over 65% of the foreign-born people that have come to the United States and obtained their PhD remain in America. Over 50% of the startup companies that are creating new technologies, uh, producing billions of dollars, have been started by foreigners, immigrants coming into this country and starting companies as a result of being educated here in America. However, now we have new immigration policy, which is making it much harder to get citizenship in America. And countries like Canada and, the, the, and Europe, they are all now working to get those talented young people to come to their countries to be educated in their institutions. Because it, you know, America is a business. And the way that you succeed in business is you hire the best people you can get. You know, it's not much different than sports. If you wanna win the national championship, you have to recruit the top players. So Nebuchadnezzar's approach to this was actually pretty brilliant because he would come into an area, he would besiege the area, he would annihilate it, and he would take from it the spoils of war, which, yes, there were silver and gold and uh, all of those things. But Nebuchadnezzar wasn't necessarily interested in the silver and the gold. He was interested in the talent of the people, which is brilliant. The way that he's going about conquering countries and taking from those countries the brightest and the smartest people he can find is brilliant. Because these are the people that will be his future. You know, it's often been said that our kids are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. What song is that? <laughs> I believe in Mary. Anyway. So that's what Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is doing here. He is building up his country with the most talented people. Now in verse 2, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And then he carried off the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Now, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was in control, but in fact, he was just a puppet. For it was the Lord who gave Jehoiakim to, to Nebuchadnezzar. And that's the thing that we have to understand. While we look at what is happening politically within our country, and while we choose one side or the other, I, I'm on the left or I'm on the right, some would say I'm right down the middle, which is getting harder and harder to do. Regardless of our, our political convictions, every single thing that is occurring in Capitol Hill, you know, drain the swamp, every one of those people has been placed there by God for this moment in history to accomplish his desired will and his desired outcome. Now, if you can't sleep peacefully at night with that knowledge, either you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ 
or you don't trust him to know what's going on. And this is why we are called to pray for our leaders, Democratic and Republican, because God has placed them there for this moment in history. So rather than negative comments, rather than political arguments and discussions, you know, nothing drives a individual crazier than when they want to engage in a political discussion, which typically ends in argument. And we simply say, hey, you know what? I, I, I pray for the left, I pray for the right. And I pray that they will be receptive to what God is doing and how God is going to use their life for his purpose. <laughs> now, you go to some people on Capitol Hill and you say, hey, praise the Lord, God is using you. Now, that message could probably be filtered differently. You know what? You're an idiot and God is using you. Praise the Lord. Now, that probably wouldn't be the best way to approach it, but I know that we've all been thinking it at times, haven't we? So here's my thought on this. At certain times, God allows his work to suffer. We feel greatly disappointed when our churches suffer physical damage, when our churches split, when our churches are closed down for financial reasons or for pandemic reasons. Or our churches are racked by scandals. We do not know why God allows his church to experience these calamities. But like the people who witnessed the plundering of the temple by the Babylonians, we must trust that God is in control and that he is watching over all who trust in him. Verse 3, then the king ordered Aspenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Verse 4, young men without any physical defect. Handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Now, in his first attack, Nebuchadnezzar did not destroy Jerusalem. He simply took treasures from the temple, as well as the cream of the crop of the young men of Jerusalem. And he made them eunuchs as a fulfillment of prophecy found in Isaiah. So I want you guys to hang a left in your Bible real quick. Go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 39. So please turn your Bible to Isaiah chapter 39. And let's look at verse 7. Now this is Isaiah, a prophet. Verse 7. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood will be born to you and will be taken away. And they will, they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, I wanted to give you all the medical description of a eunuch. And it is this, a eunuch generally refers to a man who has been castrated typically early enough in his life for this change to have major hormonal consequences. Castration was typically carried out on the soon-to-be eunuch without his consent in order that he might perform a specific social function. Eunuchs refer to someone who has been castrated and was common in ancient times. In most cases, they were created by removing the gonads or the testicles. Often, a slit would be made in the scrotum, and the testicles or the gonads were pulled through the slit and cut off. The wound was sewn or otherwise held together until it healed. It was a dangerous operation because it often led to infection. With no antibiotics available, such as penicillin, infections could lead to death. A man who had been castrated will still have a sexual urge, however, over time, because he's no longer producing testosterone, he'll lose much of his libido or sexual desire. This was done in order that they might study without distraction. 
He educated them in the laws of science and knowledge in preparation to become administrators throughout the empire. So now, not only are you taken into captivity, but your ability to reproduce is taken away. Now, J. Vernon McGee, in his commentary, he said, boy, if I would have been a eunuch when I went to college, I would have learned three times more than I did, he said, because I spent half of my time chasing girls. And that is testosterone. God has given men testosterone. And, you know, we have this innate desire and need to reproduce. Well, if you take away the, the vehicle of reproduction, then what's the desire to reproduce? Now, I remember as a kid, my grandfather raised cattle. And every spring, we would go up to his ranch, and we would help make his cattle eunuchs. <laughs> and this is where you take a bull... Uh, and you put a, a very large, uh, tight rubber band, and it was the rubber band was only about this big around. And we would take these big pliers, and the, t the big pliers would stretch this tiny little rubber band to be about this big around. And then you would reach up under the bull, and you would put it around the bull's testicles. And then the, and these are young bulls. Uh, and then over time, because there was no blood flow now going to the testicles, the uh, they would dry up and they would fall off. And that's how your bulls became steer because bulls do not make good meat for eating because the meat is tough. So by castrating the bull, you make the meat edible. And so this is a common practice. Now doing it on animals has been going on for thousands of years but doing it on humans has also been going on for this period of time. So again, with Nebuchadnezzar's desire to make his captives, his future leaders, he wanted their focus to be on his kingdom. They, he wanted their focus to be on his desires and his needs, not on going out and getting married and having a family and raising your kids. I mean, for those of you that have kids, imagine how much more productive you would have been in that 20-year period or 30-year period where you were raising your kids. How much more would you accomplish? Now, our kids were at camp last week, and we uh, picked them up this Friday, just this last Friday. And the week that they were gone away at camp, holy cow, it's amazing how much you can get done when you're not running them there or running them there you know, just dealing with kids. And so this was Nebuchadnezzar's goal was to eliminate that distraction. So he would castrate these young men so that they could focus. Verse five. So the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years and after that, they were to enter into the king's service. Now, it was an honor to be trained as officers in the king's palace, but it was also a trial for these dedicated Jewish boys would have to adapt themselves to the ways and the thinkings of the Babylonians. And the purpose of the, or the course was to transform Jews into Babylonians. And this meant not only a new land, but also new names new customs, new ideas, and a new language. And for three years, their Babylonian teachers would attempt to teach them how to live like Babylonians. Now, can you imagine being taken from your home, your parents, your friends, and everything you've been taught at the age of 15 to be placed into captivity where you were required to learn their language, eat their food, pray to their gods, partake in their customs, all while being told not to do any of the things that you've been trained to do. Now, you know, Americans, we, we, we are used to our routines. We are used to doing things a certain way. We are used to speaking English. We are used to celebrating certain holidays. Can you imagine a foreign country coming in 
and plucking you out of it and then demanding that you become like them. You know, I was thinking of World War II uh, when Hitler was wanting to take over the world and make everybody German. And it was a very similar thing because if you remember in Nazi Germany, the goal was blonde haired, blue eyes. And Hitler was trying to create a super race by eliminating everybody who didn't fit this mold. And he was going around and anybody that fit the mold, he was recruiting them. Now in Hitler's regime, rather than taking the talent out of these war-torn countries, rather than recruiting the best of the best, he annihilated Jews because they were the smartest people. They, they were the ones running the factories. They were the ones who were starting companies. They were the, the thought leaders of the day. So rather than tap into and harness those skills and ability, Hitler's strategy was to eliminate them. Because if he could get rid of all of the free thinkers, if he could get rid of all of those that were you know, being led by God, God's chosen people, then Hitler could be the smartest of the bunch. So he had a counter philosophy to Nebuchadnezzar. But interestingly enough, both orchestrating God's plan, God's purpose. Will you? Are you suggesting that God wanted the annihilation of 13 million Jews during that period of time? No, I'm saying that God uses the things of the world and the decisions of men to accomplish his will and his purpose. Verse 6, among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now, when offered the foods, king and when offered the king's food and wine, Daniel didn't want to defile himself with meat that may have been offered to idols or with wine that would pervert his judgment. Now, remember that Daniel is a Jew and he is under the Mosaic law, which means his diet is very restrictive. And Jews have been told not to eat certain meat, certain fowl, or certain fish. Where did Daniel get such high standards? First, I believe they came from his parents. You see, Daniel's name literally means God is judge. Daniel's best friends were Hananiah, which means the Lord is gracious. Mishael, which means none is like God. And Azariah, which means the Lord is my helper. Daniel was surrounded with godly kids. And here's my thought on this. At a parent-teacher conference that Jack and I were attending for our kids, one of their kids' teachers made the statement. She said, show me your kids' friends, and I will show you their future. Show me your kids' friends, and I will show you their future. Now, that statement, I, I heard that probably 10 years ago, and I have never forgotten it, and I pray that I never will, because that is so true. Now, Daniel's parents surrounded him with other godly kids. Mom and dad, are we making sure our kids are surrounded by other godly kids, or are we allowing them to be surrounded by the world? Now, Jacqueline was praying, unbeknownst to me, this was a few years ago, she was praying for our kids to go to a private Christian school. And admittedly, I was against it. I thought a light won't stand out on a sunny day. Putting kids in school with other Christian kids does not give them a chance to witness to non-believers like I did. I attended public school. And in public school, I was, my nickname was Bible Thumper, because there was not a kid in my school that I would not witness to, that I would not, you know, unfortunately, my approach back then needed some work, because, you know, I would tell people, oh, you don't go to church? Well, I guess that means you're going to hell. I mean, I was 
very direct in my delivery, which needed some tweaking. And I, I pray the Lord is molding me and shaping me to be a better witness to people. But that was kind of my position on it. I said, if I send my kids to Christian school, then they're not going to have the opportunity to witness because I made the erred assumption that kids who go to Christian school are Christians. <laughs> and nothing could be further from the truth. However, Jacqueline was praying that our kids would go to Christian school, and I was pretty adamant. I No, I, I'm not for this. So she was praying for months. Lord, soften Lee's heart to board Christian school. Lord, soften Lee's heart. Help him to be receptive to this. And so amongst all of her prayers, she asked me, she says, hey, can we at least go check out this school? Can we meet with the principal? Reluctantly, I agreed. While in his office, he gave me some concerning statistics. And this is what the principal of the Christian school said to me. He said, Lee, in a 24-hour period of time, a parent has approximately 20 minutes of quality time to discuss important things with their kids. He said, in 20 minutes, can you undo what the world just spent eight hours doing with your kids at public school? This question haunted me. He was right. If I didn't make their surroundings my priority, the world would happily intervene. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says this, Train up your children in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. That's a promise. Train your kids in the word and the ways of God, and they will continue to walk with God. Oh, they might take a detour as I did, but God's promise is that if you train up your kids, they will walk with him as time goes on. Now, I know that many of you have kids that are grown and gone, but you have grandkids. Many of you have grandkids. Could you encourage your kids to enroll your grandkids in a Christian school? Grandparents, could you offer to pay for your grandkids to go to Christian school? Now, you may have missed the boat with your own kids, but perhaps there is something you could do to help your grandkids get trained up in the Word of God. And I would encourage you to deeply be in prayer about this. Now, last Sunday, I had a, a, a gentleman uh, come to me, and I could sense that he wasn't in a good place. And so I asked him, I said, hey, what's going on? He said, my kids, Lee, my kids. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, we were watching my granddaughter, and my wife and I were sharing scripture with her, and we said that, you know, we are all sheep who can be easily led astray if we are not careful and walking with the Lord. Well, this man's children were not trained up in the ways of the Lord. He and his wife did not start going to church until his kids were in their late teens, early 20s. And we know that statistically, if somebody is going to get, get saved, 89% of the people that are going to get saved this year will be under the age of 18. Which means after the age of 18, if your kids do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if they are not walking with the Lord, there is only an 11% chance in the rest of their life that they're going to come to know Christ. That statistic is shocking and scary especially for those of you that have kids that are 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Guys, if we don't make a relationship with the Lord a priority for our kids and our grandkids and our nephews and our nieces, there's a very good chance that they will never come to know the Lord. So this gentleman at church, as I'm talking to him, they are sharing the gospel with their granddaughter because the, the, the parents are not making the Lord a priority. In fact, the kids aren't even saved. 
So when the kids come to pick up the grandchild, the grandchild says, we're all sheep, we're all sheep, we're all sheep. This, of course, upset the kids who now threatened to not allow grandma and grandpa to see their grandkids anymore. Now, this is a slippery slope, grandparents, because if you have children that are not walking with the Lord, sadly, you have to look at what was your relationship with the Lord when you were raising your own kids. Are you the reason your kids are not walking with the Lord? Did you take them to church on Sunday morning? Did you make a relationship with Jesus Christ a priority in your home? Because if you did not, then your kids did not see what that needed to look like. Now, some of you have children that are walking with the Lord and they love the Lord. Others of you, you are praying for your kids because it hurts your heart because you did rear them in the ways of the Lord and they have backslidden. They are no longer walking with Christ. They are not leading a godly lifestyle. And now this is transferring down to your grandkids. And for some of you, your great grandkids. And I know that it hurts your heart. I cannot imagine. Now, my kids, I have twins that are 13 and a 12 year old. So two boys and a girl. They are in their teens, and I cannot even fathom, fast forward 10, 15 years, where they are, you know, married with kids and not walking with the Lord. That would hurt my heart. Now, this is something that we need to be focused on now, not later. This is something we need to be, be, be in prayer about now, not later. You need to be in prayer for your kids. You need to be in prayer for your grandkids. But if you still have influence over your children, Psalm chapter 32, verse 8 says this, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Parents, you have got to make your children's surrounding a priority. Now, with the stuff that is being taught now in public school, I am more pro-private Christian school than I have ever been in my life. They are trying to pass things in the state of Washington now as it relates to sex education. And they are teaching in these sex education books. There's this big movement here in Washington amongst uh, Christian communities about what's being taught in public school, where in the sex education curriculum, they are showing images of male-on-male -male encounter female on female encounters, and they are presenting it as being normal. They're presenting this as being okay. Now, everything about that is contrary to what the Bible teaches. Oh, that's hate speech. No, this is what the Bible says. It says that a man is to be married to a woman, and a woman married to a man. That is God's plan. And when we go against God's plan is when bad things happen. The children of Israel were going against God's plan. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came in and wiped them out, brought them into captivity. Because they were not walking with the Lord. We need to be in prayer about this. And I will assure you that it is not going to get better. It is going to get worse. The Prince of the Eunuchs is going to change the Hebrew names because in addition to wanting to indoctrinate them into their culture and their belief, they also want to give them Babylonian names. So to Daniel, they gave the name Belshazzar, which means worshiper of Baal, a heathen god. He named Hananiah Shadrach, which means under the command of Aku, Aku being the name of the Babylonian god of the moon. To Mishael was given the name Meshach, which means 
who is what Aku is. Again, Aku being the name of the Babylonian god of the moon, when he names Michelle Meshach, he's saying, you are Aku, god of the moon. And to Azariah, he gave the name Abednego, which means servant of Nebo, Nebo being the Babylonian god of wisdom. So they're giving them these Babylonian names. Now, Daniel had purposed in his heart, we will get into trouble if we have not previously decided where to draw the line. Before such situations arise, decide on your commitments. Then when temptation comes, you will be ready to say no. Now, Daniel is being introduced to all of this new education, all of this new culture. He is taken by force. He has made a eunuch. But when it comes to defiling his body, defiling what God had told him to do, he says, no, enough is enough. David had purposed in his heart, I will not allow myself to be defiled this way. So, verse 8, David says, sorry, I'm not doing the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. God moved with an unseen hand to change the heart of this Babylonian official. The strong moral conviction of these four young men made an impact. God promises to be with his people in times of trial and temptation, and his active intervention often comes just when we take a stand for him. Stand for God and trust him to protect you in ways you may not be able to see it. But the official told Daniel, verse 10, I am afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Basically saying, look, Daniel, if you don't eat the feast that's before you, you're going to be, I'm going to be in big trouble. He basically said to Daniel, you're not going to be as healthy looking as the others. And if you want to get ahead in the empire, I can't lose my head. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he says, verse 12, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So the Babylonians were trying to change the thinking of these Jews by giving them a Babylonian education, their loyalty by changing their names, and their lifestyle by changing their diet. So without compromising, Daniel found a way to live by God's standards in a culture that did not honor God wisely choosing to negotiate rather than rebel. <laughs> Give us a test, Daniel said. Give us only vegetables and water for 10 days. Then compare us with those who are eating the king's meat and drinking his wine. As God's people, we may adjust to our culture as long as we do not compromise God's laws. I like that. Listen to this again. As God's people, we may adjust to our culture as long as we do not compromise God's laws. Now, the Bible is very clear. Even Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar, render to me what is mine. Where do we draw the line on submitting to governing authorities? And where do we draw the line on saying, no, I'm not going to do that. Now, we have seen 3,000 pastors in the state of California have said no. We will not submit to Governor Newsom's mandates that we cannot meet and have church. We're having church. Now, this is my opinion. I am of the opinion that those pastors are right. Well, Lee, how can you say that? Because, you know, we know that COVID spreads through the interaction of people. 
Yes, and we also know that if you are somebody that has ch challenged health, that you should stay home, that you should absolutely wear a mask when you go into public. You absolutely should. But that's not true for everyone. Everyone doesn't have the same medical challenges. Others are not prone to illness and infection. Now, we all can still get it, but I believe that it is a personal choice if you want to leave your home. I believe it should be a personal choice if you want to wear a mask or not wear a mask. Now, many are not going to agree with me. Well, no, 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 you have a moral obligation and a responsibility to protect everyone else. You need to wear a mask. Look, masks have been proven to be effective for those that wear them. For those that do not wear them, they are risking their own lives, but Lee, they're breathing on me. Look, I don't believe that it's right for any of us to put our moral objections off onto other people. And if you don't like the fact that people are not wearing a mask when they go out, well, you wear a mask or don't go out. But to not allow churches to congregate together, if you ask me, this is coming directly from the enemy. Because as a church body, we need fellowship. We need community. We need each other. And Satan knows this. I have a client who's never been married, has no kids, lives alone, and her church family is her only outlet. And in the absence of it, loneliness, despair, depression, So I am in agreement with the pastors that are saying we're having church, you know, and if you are a challenged health risk, stay home. We're still going to live stream the service. You can watch it from home. But for those of you that desire to come together in fellowship, in community, doors are open. Now, we will maintain social distancing. We will set the chairs so that they're at least six feet apart from the other chairs. We will make the people coming into the church wear a mask. These are all good things. We can still be responsible as a community without having to be stuck and isolated alone at home. As God's people, we may adjust to our culture as long as we do not violate or compromise God's laws. Verse 14. So the leader of the eunuchs agreed to this, and he tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And at the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked with them and he found none equal. This gives me chills. He found none equal. To Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. You just can't outgive God. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gave themselves wholeheartedly to the Lord. And what happened? They found favor with God and man. When you give God your energy, your talent, your money, or your ability, he will not owe you one. He'll give back to you exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think, according to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. One of the greatest lies of Satan is to try to get kids to think that if they serve him, they will be unpopular and ostracized. And that's just not true. Parents, Show your kids the example of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Say, here are some young men who refused to give in to the pressures and the pleasures of the world, and they found favor with God and with men as well. Yes, you will experience persecution if you give your life to the Lord, 
but there will be a sterling quality about your life and an attractiveness that comes only from walking with God. Violate that and you'll miss out on so much that God wants to do in your life. You know, early in my career, I started investing in real estate back in 1996. And I started making a lot of money. And I got to this place where I was convinced that I was making money because I was brilliant and you know, I knew how to do it and I knew where to look and I knew, I knew everything. And because of this me, me, me mentality, I got sucked into the things of the world. And before I knew it, I was out smoking and drinking and partying and going and running with the wrong crowd. Now I knew better. My parents trained me in the way I should go. I knew better, but I was so convinced that to be cool and to fit in that I needed to drink and party and swear. And, and I just led this really debaucherous lifestyle. And this went on for years. Now, fast forward to 2008 and suddenly God takes all of those things away. And I realized in that moment, you know, God speaks to us through difficulty. God gets our attention through challenges. God got my attention. And what he said to me in that moment, he said, Lee, if your efforts are not for my glory, then your efforts are worthless. And I said, okay, Lord, this time we're going to build on you. You're going to be the CEO of this company. We're going to seek you out in everything that we do. And you, this, is your, this is your business, God. This life is yours. Show me what you would have me to do with it. So in October of 2009, we started He's the Solution Ministries. And I cannot even begin to compare the decade of running a business without God and a decade of running a business with God like night and day. Now, the first decade, I, I was very impressed with my, my prowess. I was very impressed with what I had accomplished, and God was not a part of that. In the second decade, I'm very impressed with what God has accomplished, and that he's allowed me to participate in what he's doing. And it's a very different perspective. When you give of your time and your talent, and you make it the Lord that is driving what you're doing. You will be blown away by the way that God gives. When you give to God, he will not owe you one. He will give back to you exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. God gave ability and success to Daniel and his friends. Now, if you want to make a living, you get training. If you want to make a life, you had education. But if you want to have a ministry for God, you must have divine gifts and divine help. Training and education are very important, but they are not substitutes for the ability and wisdom that only God can give. These four Hebrew youths had to study and apply themselves, but God gave them skill to learn the material, discernment to understand it, and wisdom to know how to apply it and relate it to God's truth. As students, all of us need to ask God for wisdom. James chapter 5. And then work hard to do our very best. James chapter 2 verse 26 says, Faith without works is dead. And fervent prayer can never replace faithful study. Both are necessary. By understanding the mindset of the Babylonian people, especially the king's magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, David and his three friends were better able to show them the superiority of God's wisdom. The Lord gave Daniel a special gift of understanding, visions, and dreams. And in the first half of this book, 
Daniel will interpret the visions and dreams of others, but in the last half, he will receive visions of his own from the Lord and share them with us. Nebuchadnezzar talked with these four boys and found that they were geniuses, and so he gave them good positions in his kingdom. If you want to see God blow your business out of the water, if you want to see God do a crazy, an amazing, and abundant things with you and your life and your family, you must surrender your skills, your ability, your money, your time, and you need to give them to the Lord. And don't worry about money and success and building and growth. Just pray to the Lord, Lord, use my life. You've given me ability. You've given me talent. You've given me opportunity. Lord, I don't want to view those things as things that I can use as leverage to get ahead. Lord, I want to use those things to advance your kingdom. Lord, take me out of the equation. I, I don't, nobody needs to know who I am. Nobody cares who I am. Lord, let my life be a reflection of you living in me. Let people look at my life and say, I want what he's got. I want what she's got. And that's why I've always said there is no more challenged testimony than a Christian who is stressed, a Christian who is overwhelmed, a Christian who is worrying. And if you find yourself stressed or worried or overwhelmed or scared today, let's remind ourselves of who lives inside of us. If you have invited Jesus into your heart, if you have made him your Lord and Savior, the minute you say that prayer, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And through you, there should be joy and peace and love. Then how come we have so many Christians that are angry and shouting and barking and yelling and worrying? Because we're not making our life on this planet God's will. We are trying to accomplish our own thing. We have our own agenda. And we want to accomplish the things that we've established as our goals. Next time you set your goals, try setting them this way, Lord. What would you have me to accomplish this week, this month, this year, this decade? You know, when we set New Year's resolutions, you know, January 1st, that's the time to set them. Do we pray, Lord, what would your goals for my life be this year? We have the wrong image of God the Father. We think that whoever gives himself to God will be miserable, but nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give good gifts to you? Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. Serve God and he will bless your life. He really will. So in closing, the events recorded in this chapter should be a great encouragement to us when we experience trials and tribulations and we become discouraged. For when God is not allowed to rule, he rules over us. God is still on the throne and he will never leave us nor forsake us. So the application, each believer is either a conformer or a transformer. We are either being squeezed into the world's mold or we are transforming things in the world into which God has put us. Transformers don't always have an easy life, but it's an exciting one. And it gives you great delight to know that God is using you to influence others. Are we accepting the world's changing standards? Are we allowing what the world says is, is necessary or required? to affect our relationship with the Lord? So here's the final thought. If you find yourself in a situation today or lately that is uncomfortable, that is foreign, or that is worldly, you know, you're just surrounded by worldly people. God surrounded you with some godly people. Understand that God has you in that situation for a reason. 
perhaps instead of praying that God would take you out of your current situation, perhaps begin to pray that God would use you in your present situation. If God leads you to it, he will lead you through it. As Christians, we are called to live on this sinful planet to be a testimony and a light. And just like a boat on top of the ocean, it can accomplish incredible things and carry incredible loads and go to incredible places. However, when that boat allows a little water to come inside of it, oh, you know what? It's just, it's just one party, little water. You know what? I know they're not a Christian, but I love them. And, you know, maybe they'll get saved, a little more water. You know, I really want to go to this concert or this, this outing or this venue today. I'm going to skip church, a little more water, a little more water. When that boat that has been created to be on the water, but not in it, starts taking on the water, that boat will eventually and inevitably sink. Do not let the water of this world into the boat that God has given you to navigate during your time on this planet. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. Daniel and his three friends were in the world, but they were vigilant about not being of the world. And the same holds true for you and me. Christians, let's be lights. Let's be examples. Let's be cheerleaders. Let's be bold. Let's share Christ. Let's make our lives a priority to serve him. And watch what he does. God's got incredible and amazing things in store for you. But you must make the decision now that you are going to live your life for him. That you're going to give every aspect of your life to him. That your time and your talents and your energy and your finances will be for him. And when you make that decision and you become vigilant in it, nothing can move you is when incredible things are going to begin to happen. Now, this does not mean it's going to be easy. <laughs> there is no smooth sailing in the Christian life. But it's going to be fun. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you for the example of Daniel and his friends. Lord, I thank you for the way that they remain vigilant. As, as they are being thrown into worldly situations, Lord, they do not forget about you. And Lord, I just pray for each and every one of us as every day we are confronted with worldly things. Lord, I pray that we would make godly decisions. So Lord, while we are in this world, help us to not become of this world, Lord. Help us to be like Daniel. Help us to refuse to partake in what the world says is important. Help us to make our relationship with you our priority. And Lord, in everything we do, I pray that we would seek you out to ensure that we are walking with you and following your will. And Lord, I thank you that for each and every one of us, you have a plan, you have a purpose, you have given us special equipment to carry out what it is you would have us to carry out. So Lord, help us to use our skills and our talents that you've given to us for your honor and for your glory. And Lord, I pray for anyone here that's watching now, that's listening now, that does not have a personal relationship with you, Lord, that today would be the day that they invite you into their heart and that they make you their Lord and Savior. And Lord, for those that are listening and watching today, that they, they know you, they used to have a relationship with you, or Lord, their relationship with you used to be stronger than it is now. Lord, I pray that you would just pour out on them your love and your mercy and your grace. And Lord, that today would be the day that they rededicate their lives to you and they say, no more living like the world, no more skipping out on church. Today is the day 
that I'm going to rededicate my life to you, Lord. And I'm going to walk with you. And I'm going to seek you out. And I'm going to desire to do what you would have me to do. Lord, let today be the day that that prayer is made. Lord, I thank you for the way you chasten us. I thank you for the way you correct us. And I thank you for the way, Lord, that you bring us back. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If anybody needs prayer this morning, we would love to pray with you. You can see our 800 number here is uh, 800-461-0216. That is our prayer line. If you need prayer for any reason, we'd love to pray with you. Give us a call. 800-461-0216. Uh, as a reminder, the People for Jesus Conference is coming up. It's just around the corner, October 24, 25, and 26. And if you have not yet registered, please do so. We will be live streaming this event. So even if you cannot attend live, you can attend from your home. It's going to be Friday evening, all day Saturday, and Saturday from 8 to noon, um, I am so looking forward to this. I think it's going to be an incredible three days together, and I really want to encourage you guys to get signed up for that. All you need to do is go to he's the solution.com, uh, or you can go to be bold for Jesus and get registered there. Either way, love to have you guys join us for that. Until next time, if we're still here, Lord willing, we'll pick up in Daniel chapter two. Until then, God bless you guys. See you soon.